The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. So we saw in, in Laura's talk this introduction to both this idea of the child as scientist, right? all the different ways that children's learning seems to follow the many different practices that scientists use to learn about the world, not just data analysis, if, in a sense. If, you know, if, well, you know, as, as much as you know, various kinds of uh, statistics on a grand scale, whether it's heavy in learning or backprop are important for learning, we know that that's not all that uh, children do, just like analyzing patterns of data is not all that scientists do. Um, and then Laura added this other cool dimension, thinking about the costs and rewards of information, right? What, when is it worth it or not? And you could say maybe she was suggesting that we should develop the metaphor, expand it a little bit from child to scientist, maybe like the child as, um, la oops, sorry, lab PI, <laughs> or maybe even NSF center director. Because <laughs> um, as everyone knows, but Tommy certainly can tell you, um, whether you're a lab PI who's just gotten tenure or at the director of an NSF center, you have to make you know, hard-nosed pragmatic decisions about what is achievable given the cost and which research questions are really worth going after and devoting your time and other resources to. And that's, that's a very important part of uh, science and it's an important part of intuitive knowledge. I want to add another uh, practical dimension to things, um, a way of bringing out, fleshing out this idea of the child as scientist. You can think about all these are, these are metaphors, but they're things that we can formalize, and if our goal is to make uh, computational models of, and ultimately to get some kind of theoretical handle on, then these are helping us, right? By, by adding in the costs and benefits, you bring in utility calculus, and there's not just a naive utility calculus, there's a formal mathematical utility calculus of these kinds of decisions. Julian Hara Edinger, who Laura mentioned a lot of the, was driving a lot of the work towards the end of the talk, has done some really interesting uh, actual mathematical computational models of these issues, as has Hyo and the other students she talked about. Um, so the, the direction I want to push here is what you might call the child as hacker. Right? This is trying to make the connection back to this idea of uh, formalizing common sense knowledge and intuitive theories as probabilistic programs, or just more generally, uh, the idea of a program, a structured, uh, out, uh, you know, a, an algorithm and a date or some combination of algorithms, data structures, networks of functions that can describe interesting causal processes in the world, um, like for example your intuitive physics uh, uh, or your intuitive psychology. That's an idea that we talked a lot about uh, you know, last week or whenever it was, earlier in the week or last week. Um, and this, this idea that if if your knowledge is something like a program or a, f a set of programs that you can say, for example, run forward to simulate physics like we had last time, then learning has to be something like building a program or hacking. And I think you could make, this is again uh, a research program that I wish I had, um, like Laura talked at the end about the research program she wished she had. It's, it's, it's not really a wi just a wish for her. She actually is working towards that research program. And this isn't just an empty wish either. Uh, it's something that we're working on, which is to try to take um, just as Laura had that wonderful list of all the things scientists do in their practices to learn about the world, I think you could make a similar list of all the things that you do when you're programming, right, or hacking. It. By hacking, I don't mean, right, like breaking into a secure system, but modifying your code to make it more awesome, either more, and I use awesome very deliberately, right, because awesome is a multi-dimensional term. It's just awesome, but it could be, it could be faster, more accurate, more efficient, more elegant, uh, more generalizable, more easily communicated to other people, more easily uh, modularly combined with other code to do something even more awesome, right? I think there's a deep sense in which that aesthetic behind hacking and making awesome code <laughs> um, in a, both an individual and a social setting, that's a really powerful way to think about many of the cognitive activities behind learning, and it goes together with the idea of the child as scientist, right? If the form of your, of your quote, intuitive science are computer programs or something like programs. So we've been working on a few projects where we've been trying to capture this idea and to say, well, what would it mean to describe computationally um, this idea of learning as either synthesizing programs or modifying programs or making the programs of making more awesome programs in your mind? And I'll just show you a few examples of this. I'll show you our good, our, our successful case studies, places where we've made this idea work. But the bottom line, to foreshadow it, is that this is really, really hard. Um, and to get it to work for the kinds of knowledge that, say, 
Laura was talking about or that Liz was talking about. The, r the real stuff of children's knowledge is still very, very open, and that's really, we want to basically build up to engaging why that, why that problem is so hard uh, from this to what Tomer and then Laura will talk about later on in the afternoon. So here, but here's a few at least early success stories that we've worked on. Um, one goes back to this idea that uh, we, I, I presented it in my lectures last week, um, and it connects to, again, something that Laura was saying here. You know, a very basic kind of learning is just the problem of learning some generalizable concept at all from, w from very sparse evidence, like one-shot learning. You know, again, something you heard from Tommy, a number of the other speakers. We've all been trying to wrap our heads around this. How can you learn, say, any concept at all from very, very little data, maybe just one or a few examples? So you saw this kind of thing last time, and I, I briefly mentioned how we had tried to capture this, pr this uh, problem as some, something like this by building this tree structured hypothesis space. And you could think of this as a kind of program induction. If you think that there's something like an evolutionary program which generated these objects and you're trying to find the kind of sub procedure of it that generated just these kinds of objects. But that's not, that's not at all how we were able to model this. I mean, we had a much simpler model. But let me show you briefly some work that we did in our group a couple of years ago. It's really just getting out into publication now. This is work that uh, was mostly done uh, by two people, Russ Salakudinov, who's now a uh, professor at Toronto, although about to move to Carnegie Mellon, I think, and Brendan Lake. He's a machine learning person, um, also very well known for deep learning. And then Brendan Lake, this is really mostly what I'll talk about is Brendan Lake's work, um, who uh, is now a postdoc at NYU. And we, uh, you know, again, where we think we're building up to is trying to learn something like a, the program of an intuitive physics or intuitive psychology. But here we're just talking about learning object concepts. And we've been doing this work with a data set of handwritten characters, the ones you see on the right here. Um, I'll just put it up in contrast, or by comparison, to say this other much more famous data set of handwritten characters, the MNIST data set. How many people have seen the MNIST data set? Maybe in some of the previous talks. How many people have actually used it? Yeah, it's a great data set to use. It's driven a, a, a lot of basic machine learning research, including deep learning. Uh, Jan LeCun originally collected this data set and put this out there, and Jeff Hinton did most of the development of the stuff that now wins object recognition challenges was done on this data set. But not only that, also a lot of Bayesian stuff and probabilistic generative models. Now, the, 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 the thing about that data set, though, right, is it has a very small number of classes, just the digits 0 through 9, and a huge number of examples. Uh, about, you know, roughly 10,000 examples in each class, or maybe 6,000 examples, something like that. Um, but we wanted to construct a data set which was similar in some ways in its complexity and scale, but which, which, where we had many, many more concepts and many, but perhaps many fewer examples. Um, so here we, we got people to write by hand uh, characters in 50 different alphabets, and it's a really cool data set. So that total data set has um, 1,623 concepts drawn, which are which are, you know, you could call them handwritten characters, you could just call them simple visual concepts um, as, a, as sort of a, a warm-up for bigger problems of, say, natural objects. Uh, and there's, a, there's 20 examples per class, so there's roughly 30,000 total um, data points in this data set, just, just very much like MNIST. Um, you can see, just, uh, to, just to illustrate uh, here, there's many different alphabets that have very different forms. You can see both the similarities and differences within between alphabets here, right? Some of the alphabets, so, 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 so in, in that sense, there's kind of a hierarchical structure, right? Each one of these is a character in an alphabet, but there's also the, the higher level concept of a sort of a Sanskrit form as distinct from, say, Tagalog or Hebrew or Braille, right? There's some made up alphabets, but you know, one of the neat things about this domain is that uh, you can make up new concepts and you can make up new whole concepts of concepts, like whole new alphabets. Um, you can do one shot learning in it. So we can, let's just try this out here for a second. Um, you, you, you'll remember the TUFA demo. We can do the same kind of thing here. Like, let's take these characters. Uh, anybody know the alphabet that this is? OK, that's good. Most of you have not seen these before. OK, that's good that you know. Um, but let's, we'll do this experiment on the rest of you. So here's uh, one example of a concept. Call it a TUFA, if you like. Um, and I'll just uh, run my mouse over these other ones, and you just uh, clap when I get to the other example of the same class, okay? Okay, very good. <laughs> yeah, people are basically perfect at this. You just, it doesn't take, I mean, again, it's, it's very fast and almost perfect. 
Um, and, and just like, again, you, you saw me talk a little about this last time, ju uh, just like with natural objects, not only can you learn one of these concepts from one example and generalize it to others, but you can use that knowledge in various other ways, right? So you can parse these things into parts. We think that's part of what you're doing. You can generate new examples. So here are three different people all drawing the same character. And in fact, all the, the whole data set was generated that way. You can also make higher level generalizations, right? Recombining the parts into totally new concepts, the way there's that weird kind of like uh, unis unicycle thing over there, um, unimotorcycle. Here, you know, you can, I can show you, as you'll see, 10 characters in a new alphabet, and you can make up hypothetical, if perhaps incorrect, examples in it. I mean, again, I'm just going to show you a couple of case studies of where this idea of learning as program synthesis might work. Um, so the idea here is that, uh, you know, kind of as you, as you might see, these are three characters down on the bottom. And this is just a very schematic diagram of how our model tries to um, uh, represent these as simple kinds of programs. Think about how you would draw, say, that character down on the bottom. Just try to draw it in, in midair, or just for every... You know, just how would you draw that one in the lower left there? Yeah, pr are many of you doing something like this? Is that what you're doing? Okay, yeah, so basically everyone does that. And you can describe that as sort of having two large parts or two strokes where you pick up your pen between strokes, and one of the strokes has two substrokes where you stop your pen. And there's a pr consistent relationship. The second stroke has to begin somewhere on a particular general region of the first stroke. And basically, the model, that's the model's representation of concepts, parts, subparts, and simple relations, which you can see you know, might scale up, arguably, to more interesting kinds of natural objects. And the basic idea is that you represent that, though, as a program. It's a generative program. It's kind of like a motor program, but it's more abstract. We, don't thi we think that when you see these characters and many other concepts, you represent something about how you might create it, but it doesn't mean it's in your muscles. You could use other hands, uh, you could use your toe, or you could even just think about it in your imagination. So the model basically tries to induce these simple, think about them as like maybe simple hierarchical plans, simple action programs. And it does it by having a program generating program <laughs> that can itself have parameters that can be learned from data. So this right, right here, this is a program called generate type. And what that does is it's a program, a type means a character concept, like each of those three things is a different type. This is a program which generates a program that generates the actual character. That, the, the, the second level of program is called generate token. That's a program which draws a particular instance of a character. And you can, ju you know, just like you can draw many examples of any concept, you can call that function many times, generate token, generate token, generate token. So your concept of a character is a generative function. And in order to learn this, you have basically a prior on those programs that comes from a program generating program. That's the generate type program. So there's a lot of details behind how this works, but basically, uh, the, the model does a kind of learning to learn uh, from a held out unsupervised set and sort of learns the program of the, or the parameters of this program generating program which kind of which characterize how we draw things in general or how characters what they look like in general and then when you see a new character like this one what effectively what the model is doing is it's it's both kind of parsing this into its parts and subparts and relations but that parsing is basically the program synthesis. It is pretty much the same thing. You're constructing, you're looking at that output of some program and saying, what would be the best simple set of parts and subparts and relations that could draw that? And then I'm going to infer the most likely one and then use that as a generalizable template or pr program I can then generate other characters with. So here, to, to maybe to just illustrate really concretely, um, if you were to see uh, this character here, well, here, here's, here's one instance of one class. Here's an another class. Again, I have no idea which alphabet this is. Now, what about this one? Is it class one or class two? What do you think? One, yeah. Anybody think it's class two? Right, okay. So how do we know it's class one? Well, at the pixel level, it doesn't look anything like that. Right? So this is, again, an example of some of the issues that Tommy was talking about, a really severe kind of invariance. But it's not just translation or scale invariance, although it does have some of that, but it also has this kind of interesting within-class invariance. Right? There's, it's a rather different shape. It's been distorted somewhat. So a program is a powerful way to capture that, where you can say, well, if you, it, here, if you, you would induce something like the program for generating this, which is like one stroke like that, and then these other two things that's shown with the red and green, and here's a program that you might induce to generate that. And then the question is, which of these is most, or, or 
which of these two programs, simple motor hierarchical motor programs, is most likely to generate that character? Now it turns out that it's incredibly unlikely to generate any character from one of these programs. Um, but uh, these are the log scores, the log probability. So this one is like 2 to the negative 758, and this one is like 2 to the negative 1880. <laughs> I don't know if it's base E, or it's maybe 2 or E, but whatever. So each of these is very small. But this one is like a 1,000 orders of magnitude more likely than, than that one. And that makes sense, right? It just is easier to think, think intuitively about generating this shape from that, the, the distortion. So that's basically what the system does. And it's able to do this remarkable thing that you were able to do too, this one-shot learning of a concept. Here's just another illustration of this, right? We show people one example of a new character in an alphabet they don't know and ask them to pick out the other one. Everybody see where it is here? It's not that easy, but it's doable. Down here, right? So people make, you know, are, are better than 95% correct at this. This is error rate. So the error rate's less than 5% for humans and also for this model, but for a range of, of more, you know, sort of more standard deep learning models, um, this one here is basically like an ImageNet or MNIST type one, so this is the kind of model that was really uh, so sort of massive convolutional classifier. The best deep learning one is actually something for this problem, is what's called a Siamese ConvNet, and that can do somewhat better, but it's still more than twice as bad as people. Um, so we think this is one place where, at least in a hard classification problem, you can see that deep learning still isn't quite there, whereas this, uh, even, the, even the best thing, this, this was a network that was basically specifically worked out by one of Russ's students for about a year to solve exactly this problem on this data set. Um, and it, it substantially improved over a standard deep learning classifier, um, uh, which substantially improved over a different deep learning model that Russ and I both worked on. So there was a, there's definitely been some improvement here, and you know, never bet against deep learning. I can't guarantee that somebody spends their PhD, they could work out something that could do this well. Um, but it, it's still, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a case which still has some room to push where, for example, just a pure pattern recognition approach might go. But maybe more interesting, right, is again, going back to all the things we use our knowledge for, kids might use our knowledge for, is we don't just classify the world. We understand it, we generate new things, we imagine new things. So here's a problem, here's a place where you can use your generative program that none of these networks do, at least by, by nature. Maybe you could think of some way to get them to do it. And this is to say not just classify, but to produce, imagine new examples. So here's an illustration of this where we gave people one of these uh, an example of one of these new concepts, and then we said, draw another example of the same concept. Don't just copy it, make up another example of the concept. And what you can see here is a set of nine examples that, that nine different people did in response to that query. And then you can also see on the other side, nine examples of our program doing that. Can anybody tell which is the people and which is the program? Let's try this out. So, um, which is the machine for this character, the left or the right? How many people say the left? Raise your hand. How many people say the right? Okay, about 50-50, very good. <laughs> How many people say this is the machine for this one? How many people say this is the machine? Maybe slight preference there. No. How many people say this is the machine? How many people say this is the machine? How many people say this is the machine? Some people really like the left. How many people say that's the machine? Okay, basically it's 50-50 for all of them. Here's the right answer. Uh, I don't know, you could decide if you were right or not, I don't know. Um, here's another set. Again, I, I hope it's clear that it, this is not an easy task, and in fact, people are basically a chance. We've done a bunch of studies of this, and most people just can't tell. Um, the average people, are, on average, are about 50% correct. You basically just can't tell. So it's an example of a kind of Turing test that a certain interesting program learning program is solving, right? At, 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 at a level that's confusable with humans, this system is able to learn simple programs for visual concepts and not just classify, but use them to create new things. You can even create new things at this higher level that I mentioned. So here the task, which again, people and machines are roughly similar on, is to give, be given 10 examples, each of a different concept in a higher level concept, like an alphabet, and then draw new characters in that alphabet. And we give people only a few seconds to do this so they don't get all too artistic. But again, you, know, you can see that machine is able to do this, people are also kind of similar. Okay, so let, let, me, let me say, this is, that was a success story, a place where the idea of learning as program induction kind of works. What about something more like what we're really most deeply interested in, in children's learning? Like the ability, for example, 
to say, understand goal-directed action, these cases we've talked a lot about, or intuitive physics, again, cases we've talked about. And uh, it's part of our research program for the center, something we'd love all of, all of you guys, if you're interested, to help work on. It's a very big problem, is how do you characterize the knowledge that kids are learning over the first few years and the learning mechanisms that build it, which we'd like to think of in some similar way. Like, could we say there's some you know, intuitive physics program and pr intuitive physics program learning programs that are building out knowledge for these kinds of problems? And you know, I, we don't know how to do it. But again, here are some of the steps we've been starting to take. So this is work that Tomer did as part of his PhD, and it's something that he's continuing to do with Liz and others as, uh, as part of his postdoc. So we're showing people, again, it's much like what you saw from me and from Laura, we're, we're really interested in learning from sparse data, right? Um, because all, because the, 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 all the data is sparse, in a sense. Um, but in the lab, you know, you, you push things to the limit, so you study really sparse things, like one-shot learning of a visual concept. Or here, this is like, we're, we're, we've been interested in what can you learn about the laws of physics from just watching for five seconds. So we show people videos like this. Um, think of this as like you're watching hockey pucks on an air hockey table. So it's like an overhead view of some things bouncing around. And you can see that uh, they're kind of Newtonian in some sense. They bounce off of each other. L looks like there's some inertia, you know, inertial collisions. But you might notice that there's some other interesting things going on that are not just F equals MA, right? Like other interesting kinds of forces. And I'll show you other ones. Tomer made a whole awesome set of these movies. Hopefully you saw, you got some idea of what's going on there, right? Like interesting forces of attraction, repulsion, different kinds of things. So here's a, each of those can be described as a program, and here's a program generating program, if you like. So the same kind of idea, um, where we, you know, just as in that, the handwritten character model I showed you, it's not like it's learning in a blank slate way from scratch. It knows about objects, parts, and subparts. What it has to learn is, in this domain of handwritten characters, what are the parts and relations like? And then for the particular new thing you're learning, like this particular new concept, what are its particular parts and relations? So there's these several levels of learning where the big picture of objects and parts is not learned. And then the specifics of, for this domain of handwritten characters, how, ob how you know, what the idea of st what strokes look like, that's learned from sort of a background set. And then your ability to do one-shot learning or learning from very sparse data of a new concept takes all that prior knowledge, some of which is wired in, some of which is previously learned, and brings it to bear to generate a new program very sparsely. So you have the same kind of thing here. We, we're wiring in, in a sense, F equals MA, the most general laws of physics. But then we're, and, and then we're also wiring in sort of the possibility that there could be kinds of things and forces that they exert on each other as a, you know, some kinds of things exert other kinds of forces on others, and that there could be latent properties, things like mass and friction. And then what the model is trying to do is basically to learn about these particular properties. What's the mass of this kind of object? What's the friction of this kind of surface? Which objects exert which kind of forces on each other? Or is there some, something like gravity blowing everything to the left or the right or down? And basic, what this is showing here, it's the same kind of plots you, you saw from me last time. It's a plot of people versus model, and uh, basically on a whole bunch of different conditions of the sort you saw, people are judging these different physical properties, and they're making graded judgments of how likely it is basically to have one of these properties or another, and there's the model on the x-axis, people on the y-axis, and what you can see is a sort of okay, decent fit. Um, we characterize this experiment as a kind of a mixed uh, success in the sense that I mean, it's sort of shocking that people can learn anything at all. Like, how much could you learn about the laws of physics from five seconds of observation? Well, it's also kind of shocking that Newton could learn about the laws of physics by just looking at, you know, relative, you know in the history of the universe, about five seconds or less worth of data that people had collected for the planets going around. So, you know, that's, it is the nature of both science and intuitive theory building that you only, you know, you can get so much from so little. Um, but people are not Newton here. They're just using intuition. They're making quick responses, and they're okay. You know, there's a correlation, but it's not perfect by any means. One of the things that we're working on right now is looking at, say, what happens if you can, unlike, say, Newton, go in and actually intervene and push these planets around. Hopefully, you'll, you'll do better, <laughs> but stay tuned for that. The basic thing here, though, is that people can learn something from this, but the way our model works is it's, it's not very satisfying for us as a view of, like, kind of program induction or program construction, because it, it, we think it just knows too much. It has basically all the form of the program, and it's estimating some parameters. It's like, you know, one of the things you do as a hacker or as a coder is you have your code and you tune some parameters, or you try to decide if this function is the right one to use or that one. But, and this is doing that, 
But nowhere is this like actually writing new code, in a sense. And that's just the really hard problem that I wanted to mostly leave you with and set up uh, going, you know, what we're going to do for the rest of the afternoon. Like, if you wanted to not just sort of tune the parameters and figure out the strength or existence of different forces, but actually like write the form of the laws, how would you do this? What's the right hypothesis space? So you'd need programs that, that don't just generate programs, but actually write the code of them in a sense. Um, and what's an effective algorithm for searching the space of these theories? It's very, very difficult. I think, Tomer, are you going to show this figure at all? Yeah, so mostly I'll leave this to Tomer. But, you know, it's, it, there's, it's, it's, there's a very striking contrast between the nice um, optimization landscapes for, say, neural networks or any, most any standard uh, 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 scalable machine learning algorithm, uh, whether it's trained by gradient descent or convex optimization, and the kinds of landscapes for optimization and search that you have if you're trying to uh, generate a space of programs. If you want to see our early attempts to try to do something like learning the form of a program, look, for example, at stuff that Charles Kemp did, part of his thesis that was published in PNAS a few years ago, where he tried to generate or basically have Think of um, generative grammars for graphs. Think about like the problem. So Laura mentioned, you know, Darwin. How did Darwin figure out about something about evolution without understanding any of the mechanisms? Or the more basic problem of figuring out that the, that species should be generated by some kind of branching tree process um, versus other kinds. Remember, in last last time when I talked, I talked about various kinds of structured probabilistic models: tree structures or spaces or chains for threshold reasoning. So Charles did, did some really nice work basically trying to use the idea of a, a program for generating graphical models. Like a, if there's a, graph, a grammar that grows out graphs, and he showed how you could um, take data in the, drawn from different domains, like say those data sets you saw before of animals and their properties. We spent you know, an hour on that last time. Um, so Charles showed how you could induce not only a tree structure, but the higher level fact that there is a tree structure, namely a, 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 a rule that generates trees being the right abstract principle to, say, give you the structure of species in biology, whereas other rules like, you know, would, would generate other kinds of structures. So for example, he took similar data matrices for how Supreme Court judges voted and was able to infer a left-right liberal conservative spectrum or data from the, the proximities between cities and figure out a kind of sort of uh, cylinder, like a latitude and longitude map of, of the world just from the distances between cities. Or take faces and figure out a low dimensional space as the right way to think about faces. So in, a, in some sense, this was, this was really cool. We were really excited. Oh, hey, we have a way to learn these simple programs which generate structures which themselves generate the data. It's where like that idea of hierarchical Bayes meets up with this idea of program induction or learning, learning a program. Um, and it even captured, uh, OK, this is really the last slide I'll show. <laughs> it, really ca it even captured something which captured all of our imaginations. We use this phrase, the blessing of abstraction, to tie back into one more theme of Laura's, right? which is this idea that in, when kids are building up abstract concepts, there's a sense in which, um, unlike, say, some, a lot of maybe traditional uh, machine learning methods or a lot of traditional ideas in philosophy about the origins of abstract knowledge, it's not like you just get the concrete stuff first and layer on the more abstract stuff. There's a sense often in children's learning as in science in which sort of the big picture comes in first. The, the abstract idea comes there and then you fill in the details. So for example, uh, you know, Darwin figured out in some sense the big picture. He figured out the idea that there was some kind of branching process that generated species. It was random, not a nice perfect um, uh, Linnaean seven layer hierarchy, but some kind of random branching process. And he didn't know what the mechanisms were that gave rise to it. And similarly, Newton, right, figured out something about the law of gravitation and everything else in his laws, though he didn't know the mechanisms that gave rise to gravity. And he didn't even know G. He didn't even know the value of the gravitational constant. That couldn't be estimated for 100 years later. But somehow he was able to get the abstract form. And these nice things that Charles Kemp did were also able to do that. So, for example, from very little data to figure out that animals should be generated by some kind of a tree structure, as opposed to, say, the simpler model of just a bunch of flat clusters. The, the model was able to figure that out over here on the right from just a small fraction of the data. And then with, with all the rest of the data, it was able to figure out the right tree, in a sense. And we called this the blessing of abstraction, this idea that, you could, that often in these hierarchical program learning programs, you could get the high level idea before you got the lower level idea, and then fill in the details. And there's, I, I, we, I still think there's something fundamentally right about this idea of, 
uh, children's learning, and that in both uh, representationally and mechanistically, and that this dynamics of sometimes getting the big picture first and using that as a constraint to fill in the details is fundamentally right. But actually understanding how this, you know, either algorithmically how to search the space of programs for anything that looks like an intuitive causal theory of physics and relate that to the dynamics of how children actually learn, that's the big open question that I will now hand it over to our, our other speakers.